Good evening, and welcome to Recovery at Cokesbury. My name is Jalissa. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with substance abuse, anxiety, and fear of abandonment. We are so glad you made a choice to be here tonight. We want you to know a few things about who we are, what we do, and why we're here. We love Jesus and have seen Him work miracles. You can be the next miracle. This is a safe place. There are opportunities to share, ask questions, or simply just come and hang out with us. Recovery at Cokesbury is for anyone dealing with life challenges, relationship issues, chemical addiction, compulsive behavior, and loss. Scripture is the foundation for our teaching. The 12 steps are based on Scripture and are our daily tools for recovery. We encourage participation with AA, NA, and Al-Anon. True change and healing begin in our open share groups. Check one out tonight. For more information about our groups, please visit recoveryatcokesbury.com. Thanks for joining us. We're confident you're in the right place. You'll be understood, respected, and loved here. And please remember, you are never alone. Well, good evening, Cokesbury Chairs. Welcome to Recovery. It's a windy one out there, isn't it? We'd love to invite you guys to stand and sing these songs with us. See, there is power, power Here in this hour, this hour We are all together, together Sing that again. There is power, power here in this hour, this hour. We're all together, together, waiting here as one.
feel free to clap your hands like this. Yeah, how about that man band tonight? Yeah. Josh, can you keep up with these guys? Just barely. Yeah. Just barely. <laughs> Way to go, guys. That is awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, good, another good hand for these guys. Well, we want to welcome you to, uh, again, to Recovery at Cokesbury. We're so glad you're here tonight, especially those of you 
who have walked through those doors for the first time, we just ask that you keep coming back. This, uh, this place will feel like more, more like home the more you show up, and uh, we're off to a good start tonight, so we're thankful for that. My name is Clay. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with being an idiot. Right, Kevin, um, among, among other things, but we're glad you're here. At this time, two quick announcements. Um, we're going to dismiss the kids so they can go to their program at this time. And uh, also want to remind you that uh, we don't need to have any photos or videos going on, no pictures, just to uh, protect everyone's anonymity. So we ask that you honor that. One announcement that uh, I want to bring up to you, a pretty serious announcement. If you have uh, been here, coming around here the last several weeks, you've heard us talk about a new support group that we're going to start next Thursday night. It's the uh, Eating Disorder Group, and uh, it's going to meet in 405 after the service, same time as the other groups. Um, this is a group that we haven't had around here for a while, and if you know somebody who is struggling with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating, that type of thing, um, you really need to encourage them to come to this group. Uh, I'm not sure that there's another support group in this area for this. And so that makes it even more important. Uh, we know people that have died from this disease just like others. Um, and that's a sad thing, as always. Um, the other thing that makes this group so important is a lot of our compulsions and addictions, such as drugs and alcohol and some of the others, you know, you find a way to get away from them. You can't get away from food because you've got to have that to, to eat and stay alive. And so it makes it even harder. And people, a lot of people just don't understand this disease. Um, so I would encourage you, if this is one of your struggles, please, please check this out. If you know somebody, this could, this could actually help save their life. Um, if you have any questions at all, about this group. Um, I have a lovely lady that's sitting right over here right next to me that will answer those questions for you. If you've got questions about that group that's going to start next week, um, she will be glad to answer those questions, which you can read between the lines and know that she's going to be the, the leader of this group. Um, she and I have been married for almost 39 years. Hey. <laughs> I know how sometimes this has been a struggle and it affects everybody. So she's the perfect person to lead this group and you'll, your person, if you send somebody, will be in great hands. So I'm not even, I was not even asked to do a pitch for this group, but I just feel led to do that. So uh, just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, starts next week uh, after the service. All right, let's get to the uh, steps. The 12 steps, I'll read the step if you'll follow along with the uh, biblical comparison. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors that our lives had become unmanageable. I see there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the brokenness that is still within me. Romans 7:23. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. When we were powerless to help ourselves, God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus to die for us. Romans 5, 6. Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and life over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1. Step four, we made a, a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us test and examine our ways and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 3, 40. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Confess your sins to each other 
and pray for each other so that you may be healed. James 5, 16. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Step seven, we humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. If we confess our sins to God, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Step eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Step nine, we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. Step 10, we continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Romans 12.2. Step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Hebrews 4.16. And step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Jesus said, go home to your family and friends and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Mark 5, 19. At this time, while the band plays the next song, we're going to take up an offering. The baskets are up here. Feel free to come up and, and uh, give back to this program that has really assisted God in, in saving so many lives and giving us so much freedom. Uh, that would be an awesome thing to do. Let us pray. Father, we do ask that you bless everything given tonight for your glory and for the lives that will be changed forever. We're so thankful that we have this place to come to on Thursday nights and we can walk in here and be among those who understand what's going on. We just thank you for that blessing. Amen.
A cool gizmo you got there. What? What gizmo? That thing is like a, it's like a little. It's a this little dude, mic right? and a little stand, and it's like oh, very yeah. cool. Tech team's very. What do you got to do to get one of those? Sing on stage. Do you want one? <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk yeah, to some mine, people. I'm done with. All right, thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you guys very much. So, um, I just got water all over this stand. That's all right. That's the way it has to go. But um, I'm using Terry's notes as a blotter. What do you think of that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, my name is Mark, a believer in Jesus Christ. And I struggle with codependency. And, man, a couple things happened to me. Uh, one, one very important thing happened to me kind of over the weekend that I got to kind of tell you the deal about. Um, I got the opportunity to go to a a adult child of alcoholics um, group. And I did that on Saturday morning and and Lori was there and a couple of the people from here were there. And honestly, I just kind of went there because I thought it was one of those things where maybe it was like the right thing to do, you know, and maybe it'd just be a good thing to show up. And then like, I got completely disarmed by the Holy Spirit in that place, right? So I heard some incredibly good talks there. And I mean, like really, really good talks there. And um, I would encourage, I mean, it's not the only place where you can do a group like that, but I would encourage you, if that's something that um, has gone on for you, and it's not really, it's not really just tied to people that have, um, you know, that, that are adult children of alcoholics or addicts, but it also could have a lot to do for people that are, have struggled with somebody in their life who has struggled with a level of mental illness 
you have a parent that had been through something like that, that could be very, very helpful. But, um, and generally codependency, all of that's gonna be really, really helpful. I would encourage you to look up one of those groups, ACOA Knoxville is where you would look. You'll find the one that I'm talking about at um, the Christian Church uh, off of um, Smith Road, right? Smith Road? And right there, right there by across well, street from Weigel's, if you know where that is. And um, like kind of like kind of like behind the kind of like behind the funeral home there. That's where that is. And um, there are several other meetings that are going on around town. But if that seems like something that would be a match for you, you can let me know and I'll fill you in on everything that I know about it. We, um, as, um, as Clay said, we are starting the eating disorder group for women, and it'll be room 40405, right, 405. So if you wanna know where that is, you can ask us next week, and we'd be glad to be able to show you. We're also starting the Trauma One group, which that group will be now April 21st, right? And we don't have a, um, we don't have a room for that yet, for that yet, but we will. And um, love to have you be a part of that group. It'll probably be... I think we'll probably do it by registration, right? I think that's how we'll do it. And that registration should be available um, by next week. So we're doing a um, kind of a special sort of a talk next week. And a friend of mine is gonna be here and it's gonna, we're gonna have an opportunity to um, talk about a, a service opportunity among some other things. And I think that's also gonna be good for us to get involved in what I think can be like a longer term project for us. Excited to be able to do that. Last, um, we're having a recovery social, indoor, maybe a little bit outdoor picnic. If it doesn't snow, for God's sakes, it just keeps getting colder. Why? What have we ever done to God? That's like the thing. <laughs> okay, I'll take that back. It's just like, come on. You're like, God, Mark, that's horrible theology. I'm aware. So um, it'll be May 1, May 1, 5 to 6.30. We'll provide meat and drinks. And your job is to bring a decent, above average, freaking side dish. Don't bring some kind of stupid dessert, amen? We're not having any desserts there. Any dessert we have will be outright flat rejected, amen? That's probably not true, that's probably a lie, but that's probably not true, but it doesn't matter, it doesn't really have to be true, it just has to be funny, that's the thing. That's how we do it. Let's pray together, sweet Jesus, thank you for this time in this room. It's so good to be with you and it's so good that you give us the opportunity over and over again to be free. We may not, we may not be sure that we love you. We may not be sure that we believe you. We may not be sure that we believe in your promises. We may not be sure that you're really gonna be there for us. And Lord, what we ask for you to do tonight is just show up and show us why that can be true. And I know, I know for me, that's absolutely true. I know for a lot of people here, that's become absolutely true. Lord, I pray for everybody else who is challenged tonight by that idea. And I pray that you would make it true and make it so for all of us in this place. In Jesus' sweet name, amen. So tonight we're finishing up uh, the book, Search for Significance. I would like to be able to say to you that somewhere um, Next fall, we'll be sort of doing this as a class. I would like to say that I believe that's true. If you're interested in um, teaching this class, then let me know. I'd love to be able to talk to you about that at some point in time. So um, that's kind of an objective of ours that we're gonna revisit that book as sort of as a class in like, I don't know, six weeks or something like that. But we shall see. And we're working tonight um, so on the last subject, pretty much, the book goes like into sort of a two-thirds, one-third. First two-thirds are uh, content and text. The last third is really a workbook. You can also buy the um, workbook as a workbook and use the book separately if you would like to be able to do that. And the book is also available on um, audiobook, and it's available on Kindle, all those ways. So um, if you don't have that book, I would encourage you to think about getting it. Um, and um, reading it through. So tonight we're working on guilt, last big subject. And we kind of went back and forth, do we, teach, um, do we teach shame first and then guilt? Do we teach guilt first and then shame? What we kind of landed on in our discernment group is, we landed on the fact that we know 
that the hardest hitting two pieces of this, the things that have the best opportunity to demolish everything we're talking about in terms of our identity in Jesus, they just gotta be guilt and shame, amen? One way or another, that's what's gonna take you there. One way or another, it's gotta be true that guilt and shame cause the highest level of resentments, cause the highest level of relationship, relationship breakage, cause the highest level of fear, right, for all of us. And we just, we primarily, we have learned to do these pieces of guilt and shame very, very well by suffering in silence. You know, these two topics are things that we just do not want to talk about very much. We don't want to do it, right? We want to do anything but talk about being ashamed. We want to do anything but talking about feeling guilty. We have already decided that, that based on um, judge and jury, and we've decided somehow that God sees it the way we do, most of us have decided that we have already judged and assessed ourselves as guilty as charged or shamed as charged when it comes to these subjects. I wanna read through what the, um, what the identity statements are involving what McGee says about our identity. I wanna talk about that for a minute. It says, I am deeply loved. I am fully pleasing. I am totally forgiven. I am totally accepted. I am complete in Jesus. And man, isn't it true that every one of those statements goes the way of the buffalo when we find ourselves overwhelmed by guilt and overwhelmed by being ashamed of ourselves. Isn't it true that we simply can't figure out a way to accept and live out of what God is saying about us and the way God is trying to love us? You know, isn't that, isn't that who we are? Let's look at this. This is what it says. We trample the, this is uh, Oswald Chambers of all people. <laughs> he says, we trample the blood of the Son of God underfoot. If we think we are forgiven, now I want you to get this. If we think we are forgiven because we find ourselves sorry for our sins, the only reason for the forgiveness of our sins by God and the infinite depth of his promise to forget them is the death of Jesus. Our repentance is merely the result of our personal realization, not what we did, right, but our personal realization of the atonement by the cross of Christ, which he has provided for us. What did I accomplish in trying to do any of that? Nothing, right? Christ Jesus became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Those are all big words, but they all have to do with God loving us for who we are and God loving us to a place of freedom. Once we realize that Christ has become all this for us, the limitless joy of God begins in us. And wherever the joy of God is not present, the death sentence is still in effect. Wherever the joy of God is not present, the death sentence is still in effect. So what produces guilt? Well, here's a list. Absence of healthy boundaries. What I should do, what I ought to do, what I need to do, what I'm not doing, all that, right? Absence of healthy boundaries. Number two. Anybody, anybody got that, by the way? Absence of healthy boundaries? No, no, no we all, no, 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 we don't have that, right? Number two, unrelenting standards. Anybody, anybody operating with unrelenting standards? You look, one of the ways to look at that is you look at a closet and you go in and you're looking at that closet and you realize that left or right, things are really out of order. Like, and they're out of order because they're not in order, right? That's the only reason they're out of order. Nine out of 10 people, 9.9 out of 10 people will not say that they're out of order. They're like, clothes are hanging up. It looks like it's in good order. Good order, everything's fine. But then there's you. Your unrelenting standards say, if the clothes are not matched with colors correctly, and if they're not in the proper order, and they're not hanging in the right spot, things are bad. Like, 
Things are unsafe. Nothing is really manageable. The world is chaotic. The world is chaotic. You know, like, when I look at, I've talked about this before, but when I look at, um, when I look at, when I look at my wife's, when I look at my wife's ability to deal with chaos, and I look at mine, I swear to you, she is like way up here with her ability to manage that, and yours truly is about here. It's like unbelievable. Like I'm sitting around trying to ask questions and do this and do that. And she's like, yeah, it'll, I mean, it doesn't always work out this way, I gotta say, but she'll be like, well, it'll, it'll work out. Like it does, it makes me nuts because it does work out more often than not. That's the deal, right? That's actually the deal. That's a confession of sin right there. <laughs> not every time, but once in a while. I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk it back. Once in a while. In a great chance of opportunity every 72 years, that's what happens, no, none of that's true, but the unrelenting standards thing is a big issue that is a huge guilt producer for a whole bunch of us, right? Puritanical standards, and I just don't mean standards about sex, but puritanical standards. Standards that I cannot possibly live up to. Things about myself that I aspire to, that I will never be, I will never be the kind of person that I think I ought to be. Brendan Manning says it like this. We all ought to stop worrying about trying to be the person that God wants us to be because we're never gonna be who we think we ought to be. And that is so true and it's so honest of him to say that and to realize that while that is happening, while we are yet not being who we wanna be, God is still completely loving us. Fully, freely, absolutely, completely forgiving every bit of us, right? Every bit of that, every bit of that. True guilt, this is McGee, true guilt is an objective fact. False guilt is a subjective feeling of pain and rejection. True guilt is an objective fact. I go into a store and I take $2 and, well, who knows how much it is now. I take $2.71 of, um, I don't know what, my new favorite thing, there are a lot more than that, would be like sports drinks. Sports drinks are like the ultimate hot commodity of the world today, amen? You cannot go into a store hardly and buy yourself a freaking Gatorade. Like, I've had all kinds of explanations. Well, it's people, all people taking it because of COVID, all this and that, but it's like a, a plastic shortage. It's like, whatever, but I mean, that, that whole thing is, that whole thing is like, I go in there and I take $2.17 or whatever of this one Gatorade. They see me on the camera. They go, sir, it appears that you didn't pay for or you took that, you took that Gatorade. It's like, it's the absolute immutable fact of truth that that is what happened, right? The proof is there, the evidence is there, everything is there, is there, it's an objective fact. False guilt is something very different. False guilt is a subjective feeling, stuff I feel inside, feeling of pain and a feeling of rejection. I wanna talk about some of that in a minute. Guilt is a strong motivation but it plays in our fears of failure and rejection. Therefore, it can never ultimately build, encourage, or inspire us in our desire to live for Jesus. Amen? It's just like, it's like take the, um, take what, I don't know if you were here last week, but Alex was talking about, Alex was talking a lot about um, uh morph disorder, right? He was talking a lot about, he's, Alex said, when I look at a mirror, I don't see myself the way you see me. That was an unbelievably important thing he said. Really critical, right? So you're gonna be into those conversations a lot, I'm sure. Well, like the way it is, is like, why is that true? It's true because I feel so guilty about the way I perceive myself to look and the kind of negative impression that I have with myself that I'm carrying around that regardless of the way I actually look, it doesn't matter because I see myself the way I've always seen myself. Does that make sense? And so what it is is like, it, that, that would be just like an eating disorder part of that, but let's talk about 100 other things. Let's talk about the cycle, the classic cycle of addiction. Here's the cycle of addiction. I decide that, I decide that you know, somewhere along the way, it's a good idea for me to use, um, to use a specific drug of choice or alcohol to be able to soothe the way I feel. 
And at the first, seems fairly attractive. It, it seems like it settles my nerves, right? It seems like it causes me to have more emotional balance. It seems like it gives me a little more emotional freedom. It seems like it helps me to feel like I'm standing on firmer ground a little bit. It seems like it gives me confidence or it might give me confidence. It seems like for a while it strengthens me. And that can go on for a while, right? Like that's true about, we can talk about codependency like that. We can feel like for the longest time, it's not a half bad idea for me to get involved in everybody else's life because you know what? They really need me. They really need me to be me. They need me to rescue them. They need me to take care of them. They need me to speak for them. They need me to save them. And I'm doing a mighty fine job of it. There were these little interruptions like in my life, you know, when people would say, well, who asked you? (laughs) <laughs> that was like very, once in a while, my kids would say something like that. It's like, what? You know, like, what do you mean who asked me? What is that? What is who asked me? Like, I'm doing a fine job of this and you need to pay attention and you need to appreciate that. Except what happens is somewhere along the way in that cycle of things where I'm somewhere now it appears I'm being rewarded and I'm being rewarded even just maybe by myself. I'm able to reward myself for the success of my compulsion. Now what happens? Now all of a sudden I'm gonna hit a place where I'm not being rewarded. And because I'm, getting, I'm now getting negative, a negative response or a negative reaction from other people in my life, right? They're telling me, stay out of it. I'm hearing that if I'm codependent. I'm hearing, why can't you just quit if I'm drinking alcoholically or using addictively? And that's what I'm, what I'm kind of getting to, right? And then it's like, now I feel guilty. Now I feel guilty about that. What happens to me the more I feel guilty? Or I might even get to the place of eventually feeling all the way ashamed. What happens to me when I start to feel guilty or I start to feel ashamed? What happens to me is it causes me to go, since I feel this way, guilty and ashamed, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drink or use more, right? Because I've gotta be able to feel better than I feel now, so I will drink or use more. And that makes this cycle like almost insidious. It really does, and that is why these two emotional realities cause unbelievable damage for all of us. Therefore, it can never, guilt can never, will never ever ultimately build, encourage, or inspire us in our desire to live for Jesus, amen? McGee says that, he is right. How, how, how have I felt good about myself as a creature of God How have I felt good about myself as someone who's walking around with Jesus when I'm living with the should-haves, the would-haves, the could-haves? How am I gonna be able to do that? How am I gonna be able to do that? Guilt is actually what we probably know best about ourselves. The false belief is well, guilt's gonna motivate me to do the right thing. It, it just, it doesn't do that. If that's true, it's causing me, a, the piece of myself is coming out of me every single day, all week long. If I'm striving to do better because I feel guilty, I'm just gonna get worse. I'm gonna become either more resentful, more unhealthy, more afraid, or more compulsed. One of those things is gonna happen to me, amen? It just is. If I, if I continue to play, if there's a death in my life, which is why I think this, our hurt and loss group is so important. If there's a death in my life, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to find a way to overthink, over-rationalize, and over-examine what I should have, could have, would have done if I would have done it correctly. Maybe I could have saved their life. Maybe I could have saved their life. It's like, how would you have done that? And you have to understand those conversations are never rational. They're always important, but they're never rational. What are you ultimately saying? What am I ultimately saying when I wanna believe that that's true? I'm saying I wanted and want to be the one who is still in charge, right? I wanna be in charge. I need to feel like I'm in charge. I need to feel like I have more power than I actually honestly do. Guilt is what we do best 
Because in a very odd sort of a way, while it makes us feel so much worse, it still gives us the opportunity for power. Conviction, now conviction is something entirely different. Conviction moves us, drives us to change. Conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit. Conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's like in a long, in a long, a longer conversation than you want to have, they're like, they're what are called the three uses of the law. I don't really love all these terms, but that's what those are called. And so it's like the first use of the law is the conviction, is the, is the guilt use. And the guilt use fails at its attempt of trying to draw people to Jesus 100% of the time. Because when you end up with Jesus based on guilt, you will eventually resent him, amen? You will eventually resent him. Conviction is like what's called the second use of the law. And the second use of the law moves people moves people into the arms of Jesus. It moves people into the arms of Jesus. The Holy Spirit moves on your heart and moves you into the arms of Jesus. You don't, here's a newsflash, you don't have to be, you actually do not have to be a believer for Jesus to begin to move on your heart with the Holy Spirit, amen? He didn't like Jesus needs your permission. Well, I mean, I'm just waiting around to see what Mark Beebe does. I don't know, I mean, I don't know if he's really gonna do it or not. That's just not how it goes. Jesus is moving in this room. He's moving on your life. He's moving on your circumstances. He's moving on your guilt. He's moving on your heart, right, left, and sideways, right now, this second, tonight. And he does not need your permission, amen? And that's how it goes. That's how it goes. Conviction takes you to this place where God begins to move on your heart and draws you to himself. Adam and Eve are desperately, Adam and Eve have a breach with God right away. God tells them, don't eat from this tree in the back 40. They go right to it like heat-seeking missiles. It's like the one tree out of 72,000 trees, that's the one they gotta have. Why? Because God said, don't eat, don't eat the fruit of that tree, don't do it. We had to have it. It's like, tell us we're really different about that right now. You tell me the speed limit is, if you tell me the speed limit is 45, I mean, I, of course, go 45. <laughs> if you tell me, this is automatic for me. If you tell me the speed limit is 45, automatically my little brain registers and it goes, I am fully capable and I should and deserve to go 55 miles an hour. That's just how it goes, right? That's just how it goes. If somebody stopped me at 45, I would be, Shocked, man. Shocked. Adam and Eve, that's exactly what happens to them. It really wasn't their influence. It really wasn't their culpability. It really wasn't who made who choose what. It was, it, was, it was all who we are as natural people, choosing to have one thing that is in the main, the most important for us. We want to be God. We want to be in charge, don't we? It isn't that we just want to be like God. We want to be God. We want to figure out some way to sit in the all-important God seat. While Adam and Eve are desperately trying to run and hide from that breach with God, and they're hiding behind the rock, what is God doing? God is looking for them. Why is God looking for them? He's looking for them to be able to provide them with a sacrifice. He's looking for them, trying to clothe them with the freedom from their guilt, amen? That's what he's trying to do. God is gonna show them what their consequences are, but he is absolutely intent on freeing them from the one critical piece of that experience that is gonna do them in, and that is gonna be their guilt. Remember, nothing, nothing creative or consequential ever comes out of our guilt. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit. Guilt drives us to depression and despair. Guilt says, you know, I'm not really that powerless. I always have a way to fix this. I can always fix this some kind of a way. I can always make this right. I can always talk to him about what it is that really happened. I can always find my way through it. I can always out-talk out -talk anybody else's objections. I can always out-talk anybody else's questions. And there's always gotta be a way out. 
I'm really, I'm really and truly not that powerless. Guilt makes me afraid of punishment. Punishment. Conviction provides the ability and the opportunity for a God change. Conviction provides the ability and the opportunity for a God change. What do you think would happen in your life right now if you fully and completely allowed God to get 110% involved? What do you think would happen? That thing that you're holding close to the vest, that thing that nobody else should know about, that thing that nobody else is ever gonna know about, that thing you cannot ever let anybody know about because if you did that, you will just absolutely shrivel up and die. Nothing good can come of that. You're gonna be absolutely rejected. You could never share any of that, not really. You just couldn't do it. Yeah, that, whatever that is, what would happen, what, what would happen if it was true that God can convict that in you not for the purpose of showing you more guilt, but for the purpose of showing you more freedom. Maybe freedom for the very first time. What would happen? So the scriptures say it like this. There is no condemnation. Get this. Like, how do you hear that? Do you hear like, well, there's still some? No, I mean, it can't be. It, it, there's got to be some like, you know, it can't be just none. I mean, like, that can't be right. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature, right? Try as we might to keep it all straight, we couldn't get there. So God did what the law couldn't do. God sent his own son in a body like the body we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Here's the question. I think. Are you willing, are you really willing to let guilt, are you willing, are you really willing to let shame are you really willing to let anything and everything completely demolish the new identity in Jesus that God is desperately holding out for you tonight? Or are you willing to go to any lengths? Are you willing to do anything you have to do to become completely free of the hell of death and, and the hell, of the hell of guilt and of the hell of shame? What are you willing to do? It's your choice. It gets to be your choice. There's a, piece, there's a piece of us somewhere that maybe I think says, you know what, the best, the best we can hope for ourselves is to keep ourselves under control by feeling guilty about stuff. And you know what, God's like, man, this is completely wrong. It's completely wrong. The last thing I want for you is guilt. The last thing I want for you is for you to feel ashamed of yourself. The first thing I want for you is to know that you are a free, full child of mine. And I wanna lay, I wanna lay my hands on you and I wanna love you in the way you deserve and need to be loved. And you deserve to be loved that way because I made you. I don't want to ever want you to forget that. I made you. I made you. If you're in the middle of something that's unbelievably destructive for you, it isn't enough to just go, just quit. It's like, I wanna tell you, please understand God is as willing to run to you as you could ever imagine. Right now, tonight. Right now, tonight. Fully ready, fully capable, fully available, fully loving. The only thing stopping you is you. Man, please do not. Please don't let guilt, please don't let shame eat you alive. It's honestly not the inevitable. 
It's not the inevitable. It is what Jesus died for and over. And you really can be free. Take his hand, take the walk, listen to the heart of the Spirit, listen to what the Holy Spirit is convicting you of, be free. Sweet Jesus, we thank you for this time in this room and for this opportunity to have you speak into us. We love you. We know what it means for you to challenge us to drop the guilt and drop the shame that's so weighing so heavy on us. We know what it's like for you to tell us that you really can't see your promise for us to be free as being full, complete, and available. In your sweet name, amen. So at the end of each message, what we do here is we give out these um, white chips. Sometimes people call those surrender chips. Sometimes people call those um, give it up chips. Sometimes people call these better life chips or abundant life chips. Man, if you've decided that somehow you think there's gotta be a better way to live, I wanna encourage you to take one of these chips tonight. We, uh, we're gonna open up the space here in front of me. You can pray here and whenever these pads are about whatever you'd like to pray about. I wanna thank you so much for being here tonight. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.
What great music tonight, great message. Frankly, I just came up here to try not to mess it up, and I, I hope I didn't. Let us uh, all stand and close with a serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him in the next. Amen. <laughs>